Hi, I'm Jimmy Atkinson from the Opportunity Zones database and also host of the Opportunity Zones podcast at opportunitydb.com. Welcome to today's webinar, Finding Uncommon Value in Untapped Markets. Today's webinar is sponsored by Four Points Funding. Uh, earlier this year, Four Points was awarded the Forbes OZ20 Grand Prize as the best rural Opportunity Zone fund, so I'm very pleased to have two of their partners with us today. Some of the things that we'll be talking about today include the economic advantages of multifamily investing through an Opportunity Zone fund, why investing in small markets should generate outsized returns versus larger funds, advantages of investing in a multi-asset fund with a defined portfolio, and how new norms around remote work, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, are accelerating the increased demand for housing in rural markets. And we'll also touch upon why outdoor-focused hospitality is poised to thrive while traditional hospitality lags. Uh, before we get started, just a few things to keep in mind. Yes, one, this is being recorded and I'll provide access to the recording for everyone who registered. Uh, we'll get that email sent out to you tomorrow. Two, yes, you will have access to the slide deck as well. I'll, I'll follow up with an email tomorrow and it'll have uh, links to both the recording and the slide deck. And then three, we are gonna have time for some Q&A toward the end of the session today. So if you have any questions, please do use the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. You can also use the chat if you wanna chat informally with us. But if you have a question that you want posed to our experts today, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, throughout the webinar, we're also going to ask you some questions. They're going to be multiple, multiple choice questions, uh, really painless and easy to answer, and we'll be able to share those results with everybody immediately. Uh, one final thing before I turn it over to Chris and Stephanie today, uh, legal disclaimer, this is a huge Zoom call. Uh, please do not consider it to be legal advice or accounting advice or investment advice, and this is not a, an offer to sell or buy any investment security. It's not a solicitation of offer to buy. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our speakers today. Actually, one more quick um, introduction of, of both of our speakers. Chris Montgomery uh, will be one of our speakers today. He's the founding partner at Four Points Funding, which is a Forbes OZ20 Grand Prize award-winning Opportunity Zone Fund investing at scale in Colorado's emerging communities. And Stephanie Copeland is our other presenter today. Stephanie is also partner at Four Points Funding. And previously, she was appointed by former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper as the Executive Director of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. She was instrumental in the nomination of the State of Colorado's Opportunity Zones. We're very pleased to have both of them with us here today. So Chris, if you wouldn't mind, you can begin screen sharing and please take it away. Thanks, Jimmy. It's nice to be with you again and be with your listeners. I'm especially pleased to be joined, uh, joined by my partner, Stephanie, today. We're excited to talk Opportunity Zones and to tell everybody about what we are doing in Colorado. Happy to, happy to be here. So thank you for, thank you for putting this together. Um, just a quick introduction of, of who we are first. Jimmy mentioned some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, so Four Points Funding, we formed the Opportunity Zone. Um, Stephanie, in particular, had a chance to collaborate on the implementation of these Opportunity Zones. So it's a pretty, pretty unique chance if you're an investor or just an interested person in Opportunity Zones to ask questions to somebody who had a chance to be instrumental in setting the zones. Um, I've got a long background in, in real estate, particularly in Western Colorado, which is where our fund is based. We have a, a, a strong team, and I think the team is something we'll, we won't go through everybody's bio today, but that we'll talk about quite a bit the importance of having a strong team as you put together a fund, and in particular, having strong ties to the communities that we're in. We're a rural-based fund, and the ability to have boots on the ground to be in these communities working to, to solve the problems in the communities is really the best way to, to have an impact and to have strong, strong return for your investors. We're also advised by a, a real strong team of investors. We're gonna talk about the, both the line of credit and the uh, advice that we get from the team that we put around us seasoned investors in Colorado. And I'm going to, as we talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about us. I'm going to talk about the fund, the fund structure, spend a little bit of time on the, on the educational topics Jimmy talked about. And then I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie, who's going to talk really in depth about the portfolio of our specific projects and our specific funds. So we want to be really, uh, really transparent and really detailed about what we talk with you guys about today. And we appreciate everyone being here. Jimmy, did you want to do your, you're on mute, Jimmy, did you want to do your poll? Yeah, sorry about that. I was on mute. Chris, so before we, uh, before we move on, I did want to interrupt with our first poll question today. So I'm going to launch that now and everybody can 
click on their answer really quickly here. What is your experience level with multifamily investing, multifamily residential investing? Very experienced, somewhat experienced, or no experience. We'll get a good uh, pulse of the room here. So I'll give everybody just a few more seconds to answer that. That should be up on your screen now. Having a lot of votes come in and I'm gonna close it here in five seconds. I'll end the poll and we'll share it with everybody. And the results are getting shared now. So we've got about uh, only 20% of the audience considers themselves very experienced with multifamily investing. So a lot of people who are only somewhat experienced or, or no experience at all. So uh, Chris, that'll help you tailor your presentation for, uh, for our experience level with the attendees today. Fantastic, thanks, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, so let me tell you what I'm not gonna talk about. I'm not gonna go into to a lot of depth about Opportunity Zone tax benefits. I'm assuming that most of you are aware of the, the details of the tax benefits. If you're not, Jimmy's had a, a series of podcasts with the, the national experts on it. Great place to learn more. I'm gonna mention a couple things that I, I, th I think most of you will be familiar with. The, the basic structure of Opportunity Zones, the deferral, the reduction, and then the elimination of, tap, of capital gains. Everything that we talk about today, when we talk numbers, we talk about the return on your investment, the internal rate of return, any numbers that we use, we're gonna be talking about those prior to the Opportunity Zone tax benefit. So if, if we have a pro forma of a 12% IRR, for instance, that's gonna be net of any fees we may have, but before all of the significant tax benefits, and we do that because everybody's tax situation is a little bit different. The, but the two things I did want to point out, one is really the most important one for us is that to, to maximize these tax benefits requires a, a decade long hold. So 10 years is a, is a substantial period of time. Everything that we do in this presentation and that we do with the fund is oriented around long term, long term assets and a long term hold for those assets. The other thing that I want to point out, because we are a real estate fund, one of the things that gets overlooked many times when you see these benefits is really a fourth benefit. And that's if you hold your investment in this fund for 10 years, you get to avoid depreciation recapture. So I promise not to get tax wonky on anyone today, but that's a, that's a really significant benefit of investing in a real estate fund is that you not only get to take depreciation along the way, you can avoid recapturing that depreciation at the end. And it's an often overlooked benefit. But primarily wanted to mention that as we're talking about benefits, every number that we use will be prior to the opportunity zone benefits. Those will be layered on as a significant bonus. Our basic premise is that the Opportunity Zone tax benefit is, is massive. It's a significant benefit, but it doesn't do any good if the underlying real estate investment or business investment that you're making um, doesn't make sense. So every investment that we're talking about, every project that we're doing, we believe it stands alone on its own and then benefits from, from the Opportunity Zone incentive. So our, our value proposition, what makes Four Points Funding unique? We start with our investment thesis and it's really around inefficiencies and efficiencies. We're in smaller markets. Those are smaller markets that are typically very difficult for larger funds to invest into. They're, they're by their nature forced to invest at a really large scale. Our efficiencies are investing in what have been inefficient markets, but are really high value markets. We're gonna talk quite a bit about why the smaller make it, markets make sense. One piece of that is the exposure to under the radar multifamily housing projects. People are bringing us projects. We've been established in these communities. Housing and outdoor focused hospitality are the are the focus of our current fund. This is our second Opportunity Zone fund. So for today, we're going to be talking exclusively about multifamily housing, as well as the outdoor focused hospitality. And in our case, a big piece of our value proposition is that we not only have a defined, we have a defined portfolio of projects. We're able to do that in each of our funds because we go out, use bridge capital from a, from a very friendly uh, family office that wants to support Opportunity Zone growth and economic development in the markets that we're in. We then go secure the projects, have control over the projects. So if somebody invests with us, they're investing into a defined portfolio of funds. Um, we now have over $150 million pipeline of potential investments planned for future Opportunity Zone funds as well. So though we're talking today about Fund 2, which has three projects in it, we are also working on our pipeline for Fund 3 and for, for Fund 4. We'll have a series of, of multi-asset Opportunity Zone funds. I mentioned the, the partnership, and I, I, think it, I think it's worth bringing back up that it's a group called Zoma Capital. What they've done is they've allowed us to use really a warehouse line. They've invested into our fund as a, a general partner interest. They're a, they're a passive general partner, but they've provided capital to us, and it really allows us to go out and secure projects. We can go out, use that money to, to buy the land, to move through pre-development, even to buy you know, pre-existing assets, 
So as we take control of those, we're not going out, we're solving what we call, I believe when I talked to Jimmy previously, called it the chicken and egg problem. The idea of going out and buying land when you don't have cash, very difficult. Raising money when you don't have projects, also very difficult. We seek to solve that by having the, the cash availability to take down these projects. And then as we raise the opportunity zone money, we just replace that capital and we recycle it. The most important piece of that is it really eliminates project completion risk to investors. It also eliminates fundraising risk. The idea of, hey, if we put money in with this fund, what if they don't raise enough money? Can they move their projects forward? There's always a question that an investor should be asking. We've solved that by having access to $20 million of bridge capital that allows us to move our projects and our funds forward. Um, and it, it importantly makes things transparent. You have a, rather than a, a blind pool fund, you're able to invest into a transparent portfolio. So what are we raising? Uh, what, is our, what is the size of our fund? What are we doing? We are on our second fund, as I mentioned. It's an $18 million equity fund. We have three projects that have already been, been purchased and controlled. The total project cost on that is around $56 million. So it's around $22 million of equity. Some of that comes from some partners. Some of that comes from our first fund. We're raising $18 million for this fund, forecasting a 12% net IRR. So that's the long-term the long term return, uh, two and a half to three, three X multiple on your equity. Uh, importantly, um, we as partners, the partners in the fund co-invest, we put a $1.2 million co-invest into, um, we put a $1.2 million co-invest into this portfolio of projects. So I think it's important that the, the alignment is there from uh, the, the participation of the partners long term, both their time and their equity. We're also exclusively focused on Colorado. We're really fortunate to be where we are. We're in a place that has really significant population growth. We've talked to some Opportunity Zone funds, some of our uh, other you know, fund managers in other parts of the country where they have a, a population loss, very different prospect. Hats off to them, it's an incredibly hard thing to do when you have population loss. Where we are, and we are in Colorado, specifically outside of Denver and Boulder, um, we have a strong population growth. The, the Western Slope in particular, we do the entire state, but the Western Slope where we're based, we're based in uh, Steamboat Springs, up in a, a ski resort in Colorado, as well as based in Denver. But we, we're out here in the area that had strong population growth really prior to COVID-19. Um, we think that, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to look for a silver lining in a, in a global pandemic, but if you're talking about investing, you do need to look for things that are, that are de-risked, whether they're truly counter-cyclical or at least as low risk as possible. We think that the areas that we're in are actually seeing some strengths from a long-term perspective by what we're seeing coming out of the pandemic. We already had a strong inflow of, res inflow of residents. The ability for people to work remotely has really increased that. Um, we're seeing more and more people that either part-time or full-time are looking to be out of population dense areas, out into places where they can have, have a little bit more space. And that's where we were already investing. Um, the other thing that's coming out of this is historically low interest rates. So uh, you know, as we're, as we're building our multifamily housing that Stephanie will tell you about in a moment, we're able to at least benefit from the historically low. We've been saying historically low, I think, for the last eight years, but it really can't get much lower. It's been dropping as we go. So um, we, we're able to take advantage of that as we are in, in Colorado. Chris, can I interrupt you for a second? Uh, we've yeah. got a question from Doug who just chatted me. He, he wants to know if you can specifically define what you mean by outdoor focused hospitality. I know that's a a, a core theme in your fund. What, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, uh, that's a great question. Uh, two slides from now, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but th let me start by what it's not. What it's not is traditional traditional hotels, right? You're, you need to go on a vacation. You're going to hop on a plane and you're going to fly to Italy and stay in a hotel or stay in a villa, or you're going to just get, in, you know, you're going to get in the car and just drive to, to the Holiday Inn. There's, there's, a, there's a great place for those, but from an investment perspective, traditional hospitality has, has really been crushed by what's going on with COVID-19, both from a equity raising debt and, and debt perspective, but primarily from, it, it's just challenging for people to go. The, the, the cleaning requirements, the people being in a, in a, you know, in a tight area where you're having, you're having breakfast together and the same check-in. What we've done is we've invested in uh, several things that we've invested in, several things that we're planning to invest in. One example is we've, we've launched a RV park and a tiny home hotel. Really cool, cute, uh, tiny homes out on 20 acres. When you go to check in and you go to, we've all been cooped up. I mean, we're, some of us I think have been desperate to get away. Um, but the idea that you can 
you can't get on that plane and fly to Italy right now, but you can get in your car and drive to a place in Western Colorado where you can check in electronically with your key code, walk into your own tiny home that has it's your own kitchen, your own bathroom. You might have a shared fire pit out there, but you can be, you can socially, socially distance, things that people already like to do. Uh, the, the numbers on that, and I've got some statistics I'll share in a minute, have really been booming. So everything from, I think, think RV park, traditional RV park, um, tiny home hotel, which is something that we own. Um, we're building several RV parks, um, as well as really high-end glamping. One of the things we'll talk about on one of our projects is, you know, the ability to show up and already have really nice tents that are there. So you're camping, but you may not be, you know, camping with your backpack hiking 20 miles. There's a great place for that as well, but you may want to pull in and have some element of luxury to it. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad they asked the question. Um, I'll talk about the statistics in a minute. But that for us is an important piece of our portfolio. At scale, we're gonna be investing primarily in multifamily housing. So you know, generally 80 to 90% of our portfolios will be around very traditional attainable housing that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, not truly affordable housing, the kind that requires a separate federal subsidy, but you know, workforce housing, if you've got a good you know, good solid job and you need a nice, clean, new place to live. That's, there's a shortage of that housing. They, what's been built, especially in Colorado, has tended to be truly affordable housing or luxury housing. And that missing middle is where we're focused. So at scale, we're mostly going to be investing in multifamily housing. But the, the outdoor rec, outdoor focused hospitality, really important part of, of the multi-asset fund here. If you, if you see on the screen, you know, we've got three projects in our current fund kind of at scale. There's a, you know, a, a hundred unit uh, multifamily housing, 96 unit multifamily. Those are, you know, $8 million, $10 million type of investments. The outdoor rec hospitality might be in some projects a million dollars or $2 million. So they're smaller, but they really generate um, strong impact for the community as well as, um, you know, good, good job growth. Importantly, as an investment perspective, they have a, a higher rate of return. So they're a little bit more seasonal, but a much higher rate of return. Um, so thanks, thanks for the question and jump in, jump in anytime there, Jimmy. Um, so when we, when we sat down to have this conversation about starting our fund, you know, well, well more than a year ago, at the time, many people were coming out with single asset funds. There's certainly a place for that. We've made the decision to structure ours as a multi, multi-asset fund. The final guidance that came out in December really made it clear that you could go forward with a multi-asset fund. And importantly, you could, you could do that, sell off the individual assets, that still achieve the full forgiveness of capital gains, as well as that avoidance of depreciation recapture. So that was a little bit uncertain before that, but we're now well past that where we, we believe it's the, it's the best approach for, for multiple reasons. The starting point is really this idea of a portfolio. Rather than investing in just one project, you get a slice of each of the three projects that we have in this fund. But importantly, it takes away the, the blind pool aspect that you see in many traditional funds. So for many traditional funds, hey, we're raising money, please, please invest with us, especially you're on the schedule. You give us the money, we're gonna then go figure out what to do with it. We, we are pleased to not be able to, not to have to do that. With the line of credit and just with the structure that we've put together, we're able to provide that transparency of a portfolio, provide some diversification and some scale. Again, not back into that one project, enabled by the line of credit. I think the risk adjust, adjusted piece of it is important as well. If, if we were baseball players, we are not trying to, hit home runs with the risk of striking out. We are trying to really preserve the capital gains. You have, you're only investing capital gains into a fund. It's really incumbent on that fund manager to, to really preserve, preserve capital. So rule number one is preservation of capital. And rule number two is preservation of capital. And then preservation of tax benefits. We're very really focused on that. So these are what we, we believe to be very risk adjusted um, portfolio of investments. Stephanie in particular has done a lot of work around stress testing these investments on the downside, what happens if there is a higher vacancy? What do we do in those cases? We're very focused on appropriate leverage. We do leverage each of our investments, but across the fund, we're gonna have low leverage, strong debt service coverage ratio on what we believe to be a very low risk set of, set of assets. I mentioned multifamily, uh, that's, a, that's a key for us. So multifamily in smaller markets is, is something that has not been invested in as, as much recently. We looked at some statistics that come from the Institute for Building and Technology. Between 2008 and 2017, there were fewer than 1.25 million uh, new housing units being built every year. 
Before that, there were more than that being built every year other than 1982. Like there, it, there was a huge boom of building since, since 2008 forward, there's been a real lack and that's nationwide. <clears throat> that's really been exacerbated in these smaller markets. As I mentioned, it's been hard for large funds to invest into these smaller markets. We're really looking to solve that. There's, there's such a dearth of good quality housing in many communities. We've got these 50, 60, 100 year old houses. It's hard for those communities to attract the jobs that go with it. As jobs have been moving more towards rural areas, the housing has not really been able to, to keep pace. So we're focused on putting the multifamily in the smaller markets. The, the pandemic is accelerating that net migration in. And we'll show you some specific pictures and details on that multifamily. We believe it's, it's one of the most uh, recession resistant and counter cyclical investments you can make. Things like traditional hospitality, office space, retail have really been crushed by, by COVID. But even pre-COVID, they have a, a much higher degree of volatility. Many of the areas that we're in have, you know, two and three percent, uh, two and three percent vacancy rates, and we've modeled much higher rates than that to still have uh, attractive investment opportunities. Outdoor focused hospitality that we just had the question about that Jimmy gave us. Uh, the picture up on the right is actually one of the assets that we own. The picture on the bottom right is a is, is just a, a pretty aspirational one, but it gives you an idea of the type of things we're talking about. We've we've sat around the campfire in the picture on the upper right and done a done a team meeting out there. There's been a wedding out there. You can rent them individually. You can go out in small groups. Type of things that, that I mentioned before where you want to get, get out and, and be away and still socially distance appropriately. Some of the statistics up here, I won't read each of them to you, um, but, it, but they make sense. When you just think about them from a common sense perspective, road trips are the safest form of travel really being the biggest one. There's, I, I looked for a really pretty chart, but we ended up with a, a set of statistics for you. There's a massive movement towards this that, had, that took place. It was really a huge increase after 9-11 for understandable reasons. Um, it's been continuing to grow since then. And, and the quality of what's available too. When I think, sometimes when you think RV, you think about the, you know, the, the, the Winnebago that flew, you know, going to on a vacation in, back in the 70s. Those, those are still cool and some of those are cool and cute, but there's, there's a huge option of outdoor focused hospitality. From a revenue perspective, we're targeting much higher uh, much higher returns. Our IRRs on these tend to be in the, you know, 16, 17, 18, even 20 percent IRR. It's very difficult to get that over 10 years in an investment. We're seeing that in our outdoor focused hospitality. Again, it's going to be generally around 10 percent. 10 percent of this portfolio will generally be 10 percent of each of our portfolios. Um, I'm not going to read our, our bios to you. This deck will be available to anyone later, so it's got our bios in there. We do have a, a strong team, though, both in, in real estate and operations. Also in, in business development, we have, we've been running something called the West Slope Angels that our partner, Sean, who's on here is, is in charge of. We've been doing um, startup investing across these same regions. We are not doing that in our Opportunity Zone Fund. I always wanna highlight the fact that this fund is really about real estate and place-based businesses. But we've got a strong team around both real estate and operations. And we think investing into that startups in that same community Really, it's, a, it's an additive investment for everything that we do. As we build multifamily housing and someone else builds bike trails and someone else puts in the brewery, we're trying to, to, to really add, um, you know, we're really trying to be additive in all the investments that we do. Jimmy mentioned previously the, the Forbes award that we, were, that we were given. It was a huge honor. I wanna, you know, celebrate that with the team. We're, we were thankful to get that. But importantly, one of the reasons we were excited to be selected is that it's around that we were selected for having being a catalyst around impact in these communities, but we're not an impact fund. We are, our belief is that the best way to have an impact in these areas is to invest at scale and to keep that capital flowing in ways that bring additive investment to these communities. So I think it's important to mention that, that the, the impact is, you know, we're true believers in the impact of, of what we're trying to do and what we are accomplishing in these communities, but we're doing that through raising capital and investing it at scale into these communities. You, I'll mention the word community. It's really hard to talk about what we do without mentioning community and without mentioning opportunity. Uh, the community centered piece of this is important for us. We're coming in, the, the, the deals are coming to us, but we're not coming from the outside saying, hey, we know what's best for you. This is what we should build. We're coming in and saying, hey, what is it that your community needs? How can we come and work with you? It's, it's, it's important for a variety of reasons. I think the, the reputation is a big piece of it. The exposure is a piece of it but it also ultimately really de-risks these projects. When we're working with communities, 
we're, we're listening to what they to what they want. Having the community support you speeds up everything from the planning process to um, just the, the long term success of these projects. So that's a, that's the the overview from where uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jimmy for a quick poll and then transition to Stephanie, who's going to talk in detail about the portfolio, the specifics of what we invest in, as well as the terms of the fund. So, Jimmy, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. And before we turn it over to Stephanie, we will launch our second poll question of the day here. We want to know, and I've been asking this at, at a few of the other webinars that I've done as well. I'm always curious about this. Which of the following best describes your primary motivation as an opportunity zone investor. Why do you invest in opportunity zone fund? Is it for the social impact? Is it for the ROI? Is it for the tax incentives? Um, I think those are the only three options, but I included an other option in there for you as well. And if you do answer other, I'm curious what your other reason is. So feel free to use the chat and, and let me know. So I'll just keep this one open for a few more seconds uh, for everybody to answer, uh, submit your vote, and then I'll share the results with everybody. And uh, actually, while we do that, one more reminder that we are going to have time for some Q&A at the end of the webinar today. We'll probably leave about 15 minutes at the end. So if you do have questions, I see some are streaming into the, uh, the chat panel here on the side, which is great. But um, if you could use the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar, that would help us organize it a little bit better. So uh, please do feel free to submit your questions. I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. And it looks like uh, we got a plurality who are interested in the ROI, but a fair amount of people also interested in social impact. And Chris, you spoke about that a little bit earlier, um, just a minute ago about how you're not an impact fund, but essentially you are catalyzing some additive investments and, and creating social impact uh, in that way. Uh, so Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you to, to go through the portfolio details with us now. Great, thanks. Um, I just I do want to touch a little bit on the impact because there have been so many questions around this. Mm -hmm. So there's a there are, there are, there are impact in the ways that um, the opportunity zone incentive was really truly meant to benefit the residents of the community where capital was focused, and and there's in, in an inner city urban neighborhood you think about underrepresented populations, people looking for social and mobile economy where the broader market the broader community is actually doing well there are pockets of isolation where the community is not doing very well and that, that's bifurcated in the markets we're targeting the real practicality of investing is what's is what is driving the risk to these communities there thereby there's not such a big divide necessarily in the participation of those in the community it's the viability of the communities themselves and because of the the large size of capital that's sitting on the time on the sideline right now, looking to invest. Um, sometimes getting capital into these communities because it's so inefficient from an institutional investor standpoint is the first problem to solve. And over time, you then start to get more nuanced and solve down to the micro level in the community, different different um, cohorts of residents. So what we're trying to solve as a first step is really getting efficient sources of capital to these communities to develop basic infrastructure elements they need to support the potential for their population growth. Housing thematically in the western part of the U.S., frankly all over the U.S., but in the western part of the U.S. where population growth is frankly the highest, um, has been one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest determinants of the ability for people to move into these areas. Uh, affordable, not necessarily low income, which is highly subsidized, and would this capital source, Opportunity Zone capital source, would not necessarily be the most appropriate source for going into low income um, subsidized properties, but affordable workforce housing, which kind of spans the 80 to 120% income earners. So we have, what we've done is we are putting together, the, again, these portfolios that Chris talked about, and they will be anchored by one to two multifamily housing projects in communities that we believe have uh, where this would be the most catalytic and then we are we're tucking in smaller investments that have also dramatic byproduct upside impact and i'll talk a little bit about those so the first one in grand junction which is one of the um, economic centers that is outside the urban corridor in colorado uh, grand junction was was traditionally an oil and mine oil and gas community it had suffered traditionally from boom and bust cycles, but
but over the past five to six years has really turned the corner in diversification, but has struggled with attracting investment into the community because again, its size is somewhat under the radar and, and there's not a, a tremendous amount of evidence to say you could go in and invest in this community like you could for housing, like you could in the Bronx or in the, or in uh, different parts of bigger, uh, bigger metropolitan areas. Um, and what we did is we acquired alongside a public investment of the a new part of the riverfront that's being de developed in Grand Junction through the city. We acquired adjacent land and worked with the city to formulate um, a, a workforce housing facility that will be on that on that site and directly adjacent to that which also creates some diversification for the parcel we are putting in a, a, a an outdoor rec focused campsite and think of that as kind of tiny home rv combination so this is one project one investment that has two sources of income and revenue but are serving both to bring capital into the market create economic activity in the market and create sorely needed additional housing infrastructure at affordable pricing for the market again in that workforce range this is a 24 million dollar project we'll be levering it uh, between 65 between 63 and 65 percent and uh, very pretty conservative leverage and we're forecasting north of 11 percent irr it's actually our current plan we, our costs continue to come in lower than we expected is um, currently forecasted to be above 12% net of our fees, but not including the opportunity zone benefits. So this particular qualified opportunity zone investment sits within our, our fund. The second, uh, next slide, Jimmy, the second um, project that we are, um, that we're working on, if we could advance to the next slide. And Chris, Chris has the control of the slides there. Chris, you got yeah, it. You go. Sorry, thank you. Um, we're doing almost exactly the same thing on almost the exact same timeline in Glenwood Springs, which is um, a, a community that sits at the head of the Roaring Fork Valley, at the tail of the Roaring Fork Valley, actually, that serves Aspen, which is this community, this area which houses a tremendous amount of the workforce that serves down into the valley, um, the community. And this is a transit-oriented development sitting on top of the um, Roaring Fork Transport Authority's main hub. It's 100 units of multifamily housing, one and two bedrooms. We are also putting in a community park that will be a dark dog park serving the residents around the development. And it is um, essentially targeted at those workers that are serving um, Carbondale Basalt, the majority of the Roaring Fork Valley, where housing prices have been out of reach and rental prices have been out of reach, as well as a lack of uh, what I would consider um, solid and nice categoric um, rental housing availability. This project is also um, a similar return profile to our Grand Junction project and is uh, anchors part of the fund. And then Chris, the third slide really kind of talks to the outdoor focused hospitality. As Chris said, what we're thinking about is non-single building hospitality. This is, this is a layered amount of hospitality where people can come and camp, but they don't necessarily have to bring their own tent or cook outside or do things they can they can have their choice on how they want to experience the outside and they'll either be in a um, a high-end tent a cabin or they can bring their own uh their own gear this is a 120 acre site and the impact around this we purchased this site um with the support of a um of a very seasoned operator near telluride um, in a town called Natarita, which was an extraction town that was completely decimated when the mine closed. We are repurposing this location to create outdoor focused destination for the area. It sits ideally between Moab and Telluride. And we expect this to bring both a sense of purpose and destination back to the community, a way to monetize the land that was otherwise sitting um, vacant and it has a number of art installations which are creating a sense of artisanship in the community that's attracting um, a lot of different very um, a lot of different tourists coming in we have the new york arts academy coming in to hold a seminar um, at the site in the next two months we have different interests from different artists and communities from around the country and we believe what this will do is create a new uh, a new sense of place for a community that was otherwise 
uh, decimated through the mine closure, which again exists. There's, there's quite a bit of that going on in Colorado and many parts of the country. Um, so moving on to um, our next slide. The, as Chris mentioned, what we've done is we take um, our bridge capital, we create a portfolio, we de risk the portfolio, um, we get it through a development process and we start fundraising behind that. We close that fund, we take that bridge capital, we recycle it and we do it again. So we're creating this, this cycle of um, portfolios that we're investing around the, the rural parts of Colorado using the Opportunity Zone Incentive to do this. And we're working with other funders across the state to make sure that our investments are then um, levered and coordinated with other people that are trying to invest in these markets for different needs. So we are very, uh, we are very focused on making sure there's a lot of transparency in what we're doing and there's a tremendous amount of coordination with both philanthropic impact as well as public investors in this space. We, are, uh, we think that's the only way to create real scale. Um, we also have our portfolios, again, are identified so you can see exactly what the fund is exposed to. There's no blindness to this, um, but it is diversified because we're taking the fund and spreading it across multiple investments that we've secured. And we'll continue to do this over the next three or so years. Um, next slide. Um, the summary of terms, again, we're raising $18 million for this fund. We've talked about what we believe the return profile should look like based upon our underwriting. We have an A8 PREF on our return, so we return 8% back to our investors before we uh, retain any of the profit. And after that, it's an 80-20 split between investors and us. We have a minimum commitment of $100,000. Our fees are right above 1% for the term of the investment. They are more weighted up front because that's when the majority of our work is done, and that's where we hire uh, staff to ensure that, uh, that these are managed and executed correctly. We have no transaction fees or related party fees. Um, we are trying to make sure that we are aligned as much as possible with any investors coming into our fund. And we are also investing directly, as Chris mentioned, in each fund. And so I believe that brings us to the end of the presentation, other than the disclaimer that Chris just uh, flew through, but I think we talked about that <laughs> at the beginning. So, um, uh, happy to answer both Q&A, um, both of us Q&A that's come up and any other uh, real-time Q&A. Yeah, fantastic. Let me, let me no, go ahead, Chris. That. Just one thing to that too. Um, we're going to happy to answer as many questions as you, as you have during the Q&A. If you have additional questions, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to, to either of us. I've placed my information on the screen. As Jimmy mentioned, he's going to send you the deck and the video. We have a, we have a, this is our talking deck. We don't want to make you go through our, our larger deck, but we have a we have a more in-depth investor deck as well as full deal memos for all of these projects. We're more than happy to, to share that with anybody as well as share questions. If you're not an investor and you just have questions about Opportunity Zones, still reach out. We, we wanna be here as a resource. Um, if you are a potential investor, obviously reach out then as well. Through the website, you're able to make a request, provide your information, we'll get back to you right away. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll turn it back over to Jimmy to, to lead through the Q&A. There's one, one thing I wanted to, uh, one thing I did want to add that we hadn't really talked on is just the, re in the return structure of what we're building. I know there were several questions that we'll get to. One is that what we're doing from a, from a, just a, you know, construction process on these projects, we're building these projects right now. So we'll actually be breaking ground, you know, call it, call it January. We're not going to be generally returning cash for the first couple of years. We're using the first two years to build the assets. Year three, as we stabilize the assets, we'll be returning cash to our investors. We essentially return all of the cash that's generated every year back out to our investors, minus, of course, the part we need for working capital. Um, but we return that cash back out to our investors every year. After year 10, as we sell off the assets, that's when we return the capital and start paying back the profit. But these are income generating assets along the way. So I did want to mention that as uh, from just a return profile uh, perspective. And then with that, Jimmy, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you to both of our presenters today. Chris Montgomery and Stephanie Copeland, uh, well, well done. Uh, great fund you have here, an award-winning fund, as I mentioned at the top. Uh, please do head on over to fourpointsfunding.com if you want to receive more information and the, and the full slide deck. Uh, before we get going with the Q&A, and please do use the Q&A tool if you do have questions for our experts today. Before we get going with that, I want to ask uh, one final poll question here, uh, polling everybody's 
likelihood of investing in this particular fund? Do you plan on investing in Four Points Funding's Opportunity Zone Fund within the next six months? Uh, yes, no, or maybe you're still doing research. Uh, I'll keep that one up and, and running here, give everybody a chance to vote on that while I get to some of our poll questions here, or excuse me, some of our Q&A questions here from our attendees. So uh, Stephanie, I think this first one would be a good one for you. Marcy asks, what is the community's role in all of this? What role does the community play? Yeah, it's a really great question. And one of the things I was nervous about when this, when this legislation was enacted is that the community wouldn't have a big enough voice because this is a completely private capital structure that requires no participation from the community. What we found is that that is a, um, again, particularly in smaller markets, there is, there is no, we don't believe there's any healthy way to create sustainable investments unless the community's voice is heard. What they're looking for, what they need, how they're willing to participate, if at all, and making sure that we're serving a core need that also serves our investors. So we have to thread the needle where we've got, we're serving our investors as fiduciaries, but we're also not being extractive, predatory, or in any way ignoring community needs. There are some things that the community say to us that they need that we can't solve for. What we can do is help facilitate the conversations that may solve for that. Um, but in the communities that we're invested in now, we've worked closely with the town managers, the planning and zoning commission and the city councils to make sure, is the neighborhood happy with what we're bringing? Are we bringing infrastructure that the community needs, believes it needs in order to keep growing? Are we then positioned to do follow on investment over time. So if we put in a big housing development, are we positioned to then um, invest in um, a childcare center or invest in an after school program for kids? Are we positioned to do that later as we anchor our investments? That's really important to us. It's also, we think it's also a, mitigate, a mitigator and a de-risker in that there's a lot of benefit in making sure that you've got that support as you're moving through the development process. So, um, that's the role they play. Um, and I work a lot with communities and helping them, helping them figure out how to leverage opportunity zones as well. Excellent. I've, I've got a question here that I'm going to answer. Actually, Alexi is asking, uh, will we get a copy of this presentation or a video link to the webinar? So uh, for those of you who missed that announcement at the beginning, yes, I'm going to email everybody a follow-up email. You'll get it tomorrow afternoon around this time. It'll include a link to both the slide deck that you saw today, as well as the recording of uh, today's presentation. If you want the more detailed slide deck that uh, Four Points Funding has that includes a lot more details, uh, please do reach out to them, head over to fourpointsfunding.com and, and sign up uh, for their emails. Uh, I'm gonna ask this next question to uh, Chris here. Uh, Chris, what is the minimum number of housing units for one project that you would consider in a project proposal, and what about remodeling an existing building, perhaps? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and, and our answer is really because of that multi-asset structure. Because of the the multi-asset fund structure, we're able to do both large and small projects. That's an important piece of our uh, of our community outreach. If we were only doing single asset funds, I'd have a very different answer. It would probably be you know 50, 60, 100 units. Um, we're actually able to do. Uh, there's really no minimum size that 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 can't be done if you're doing it through this multi-asset structure. We've actually done, you know, uh, we're doing a, uh, a $500,000 food hall in one of our funds. We've done a, we've actually added in a couple of single family houses. So you can really do any size that makes sense for your team because we have a real estate, already existing real estate team, we're able to, to place some of those in there. We're not, because we're not raising for an individual size, there's no restrictions around this the way there would be with other programs. You know, practically, it has to make sense for us to take time to look at. Um, so, you know, in, in a lot of cases, um, the, the, the bigger, the better from an impact perspective. Sometimes it's as much effort to arrange a loan on a, you know, a four, a four building unit as it is on a, on a 20 building, uh, you know, 20 unit building. But having said that, because of the multi-asset fund, we can layer on smaller projects and really reach, um, reach smaller communities than a, than a larger fund can. We use the larger the larger projects as an anchor, and then we um, can can layer in the smaller ones. The idea of taking existing buildings is something that we're is, is really ideal for the program in a lot of ways. You have what's called the the substantial improvement test. Generally, you buy something for two hundred thousand, you have to invest two hundred thousand dollars, you know, minus the cost of the land. 
that works great for some, some buildings and doesn't work at all for other buildings. So it's really about the right fit. Um, that's kind of one of those questions that to be, to spend any more time on, you have to answer specifically. So, so reach out and we can talk through it specifically, but um, there doesn't have to be a minimum, there's no minimum or maximum size either on the program or specifically for our fund. All right, great, okay, thank you. And uh, Stephanie, get a couple questions for, your, for you here now. Uh, how can you make multifamily work with rents that don't support the market in areas like Glenwood? Yeah, and it's, it, it is, that's exactly the, the problem to face. The, in Glenwood Springs, um, you, you have rents that will support a, a, an efficient build. So we have, um, there is, there is that, there is that, um, that balance, that ratio has to be there. And, and Glenwood Springs is actually for workforce housing, again, 80 to 120% of area median income, the rent cost ratio to build actually works. The problem is, the amount, if, if you're looking to build in the Roaring Fork Valley, most developers and builders will go to much higher end stuff. They will go to things in Aspen, Carbondale and Basalt that will command much higher rent or much higher sale prices. And it's really forced uh, an undersupply of workforce because of the opportunity cost to build workforce housing versus your opportunity to build higher end housing. Because we are specifically focused on building workforce housing, we don't see that as an opportunity cost. We see that as value that can be unlocked and bringing supply in. So it actually does work. In Grand Junction, the, the, the trick is even a little more difficult. And the reason that we did a campsite and a housing project site is because they're synergists. They provide both support for each other and cash flows for, for each other. The housing provides a more stabilized asset and the campsite provides an alpha or more upside potential for the combined asset. And it actually works together quite well. So we're finding creative ways of combining revenue streams to make the workforce housing work in each market that we go in. And each, each market's a little bit different. Great, okay, uh, question here for either you or Chris now. What levers, this is from John <laughs> asks, what levers are impacting your range of IRR and MOIC numbers? Yeah, let me let me just take that in the individual projects because um, mm -hmm. I've stress tested so many. There are, there are three things that we think about. One, through development, are we going to come in and in our deal memos we have these risks outlined. Are we going? Do we have the right leverage? Are we leveraging ourselves prudently but not so aggressively that we put the property in jeopardy, which is a big deal. We have so we're leveraging what we consider a very conservative but prudent way to exercise cash. Is our cost of development, do we have enough contingency built in so that we are, we are not over, um, we're not underestimating the cost to develop in these areas. And we, we think those are, um, that's big. The bigger issue is rents and vacancy. So your lease up rents and vacancy, making sure that you're being very conservative on your estimate on both how much you can charge, how much your rents will escalate and what your vacancy rate is over the time are the biggest sensitivities to the model given the financial in a fixed financial structure. We have estimated 5% vacancies on both of our multifamily housing property. The long term averages given supply have been much lower than this. We can go up to we can double that vacancy and take our rents down by at least 15% without getting below kind of a nine or 10% IRR which um, which which um, kind of bounds it on the downside. The upside is if our vacancy runs more close to long-term averages, which provides the upside range. Um, and our pricing, we have assumed that instead of having 3% escalators, which most uh, non-deed restricted properties have, we've just assumed over the next five years, 1% escalators just to keep up with inflation. And um, and that there's potential upside for that, but we, we do not want to try to take that. But that that bounds some of the ranges. Great, great. And uh, let's see uh, another question here. Why is the capital raise so high on the recreation area? Two point three million dollar project, one million dollar capital raise. Is it because of the risk? Yeah, great, great question. So it's it's a little bit. I mean, in some ways, it's because of the risk, but it, I think the. The way I'd phrase it is it's because of how conservative we want to be on this. It, you know, our debt, debt service coverage ratio, especially in a seasonal business, is our, is our biggest single focus from a, from a de-risking perspective. So in multifamily housing, we can leverage at 65% generally. If we, as we're pursuing HUD loans on some of our properties, you can actually leverage higher than that. The terms are so generous and the amortization is so long 
that you get amazing terms and you can actually leverage up higher. Outdoor focused hospitality, we're gonna leverage our projects between 30 and 50% generally. Um, the more um, traditional they are, uh, standard RV park, um, we might leverage it up to 60%. There's kind of standard industry levers in there. On the, the less traditional it is, it's harder to find, it's harder to find uh, lending for it. We've modeled it to have that you know, 17, 18% IRR even using primary, primarily using equity for it. We still want to lever it. It's important to use leverage on real estate investments when you can, um, but it's more about the ability to obtain uh, debt at reasonable rates um, until the project is established. We think a few years from now, there'll be a prime candidate to, to refinance that project as it has defined cash flow. but we're using equity to, to be on the safe side and to obtain the right debt. Importantly for opportunity zones, you wanna obtain non-recourse debt so that your investors, again, won't get tax wonky, but you have to get what's called non-recourse debt so that your investors can obtain and take depreciation on their investment. As we do that, that's just harder, that's a harder thing to do on these smaller projects. Um, so we wanna be below 50% to make that happen. Right, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, another question here from Eagles. He asks, can I dedicate an investment into a single project within the four points portfolio and receive a return specific to that project? Or, or does he have to invest in the, in the full multi-asset fund? What, do you have that option there? Yeah, so, so, so our, our preference is for people to invest and, and what's really open to, to most people is just to invest into the fund. Uh, for people that are investors alongside us in the fund and the portfolio, if they have larger capital gains and would like to invest on top of what they placed into the fund as a co-investment on a specific project, you know, at a larger, let's call it roughly seven figure scale, we're certainly open to having that conversation when it makes sense, especially if they have a tie to the community. We, that community support is so important to us. We'll certainly consider it, um, but, but generally no, the answer is no. Uh, we want people to take advantage of that portfolio and I'll, I'll be in the same boat kind of growing together unless there's a, a, a sizable focus on one project. Right, yeah, makes sense. Uh, question here from Eric. Uh, if you could have one or two changes to the Opportunity Zone legislation, what would you like to see changed? I and if he sneaks in a second question here too. What are your, I'll, I'll ask you a second question in a minute. Stephanie, Stephanie, you're raising your hand. Why don't you field that first one there? So the, the first one is, I would really like to see it easier to, um, to redeploy to, to come in and out of investments to allow for more operating business investments into using opportunity zone funds. So for example, if you invest in an opportunity, if you invest in a, in a, in a business or property and you can realize a gain and you could recycle that gain and then put it back into another investment, you're essentially recycling the same dollars and creating more of an impact. I would like to see that made simpler. You can do it now with very complicated uh, structures, um, but it's it's not smooth. I would like to see that. And I'd also like to see some of the opportunity zones that were designated grandfathered. And like of the 8,700, I'd like to see maybe 20 of them grandfathered. Right, I got you. And, and Chris, did you have any other input on you what know, you might we, like to see changed? We've been partners for a while. Stephanie took the, took the obvious one there. So um, <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's, that's the huge one, right? It, if, if we could really, if the investors could stay in, but we could move in and out of assets, we could have a much, we could have a stronger investor return and a stronger community impact. Um, it, it's, it's unfortunate that that one, that that one didn't happen. You know, the complexity of some of this stuff is still, uh, you know, I, I know one of the questions people had is what does it take to start your own QOF? It takes a lot of learning and a lot of money with lawyers. Um, the complexity of this is a lot. Um, there's not one specific thing that the IRS has actually generally done a good job of, 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 of trying to, to make things as reasonable as possible. But the, the, clear, the clear change is this, this interim gains issue of moving in and out of assets. Right. Yeah, that was Eric's second question that he snuck in was, what are your top two keys to setting up a QOF, a Qualified Opportunity Fund. Do you, do you have commit, any other insights there? Commit to it for 10 years and, and really go for it. Um, I mean, obviously we're biased because we want people to invest with us. We, we've got several people that you know, have, have set up their own funds and, and for certain people it, it, it makes sense. I think the key is, is if, if you're gonna be focused on it and really understanding the compliance piece of it. Setting up a fund, I mean, it's like $50 in a piece of paper setting up a fund well and maintaining it well, especially if you're using other people's money is a, is a whole different animal. If you're using your own money, 
um, you know, the, the, I think the key is just to make sure you understand it well and have good advisors. Um, I know Jimmy, Jimmy and his partners are, 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 can advise people around that. Um, but the key, the key there is really understanding it. Compliance, setting it up is easy. Compliance takes, a, takes real effort. And that's, you know, that's part of why we have a, a team on board to do that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, setting it up is the easy part, but then, yeah, raising money and compliance, that's the, the devil's in the details on both of those things. Uh, next question here from, from Susan. She asks, are you experienced in DDA, difficult to develop areas where high land costs are barriers to assembling parcels? Um, so, you know, not, not, I wouldn't say that we're experts on that. We have, we, we face our own challenges where we're at everything from, you know, environmental to, you know, the, the bigger challenges that we have in, in these rural areas tends to be the previous question that was asked, the low rents relative to the, just the high construction costs. We're, we're not experts on the, you know, the assembling of parcels. It tends to be more of an, an urban thing. There's, there's definitely people out there, but that's not really a, as much our focus. I would also say that um, where we have seen that in other work that I've done, um, there are a lot of communities that I've noticed around the U.S. that are looking at land trust and, and philanthropic organizations to develop, to essentially assemble the partners, put that land in a land trust and facilitate the development. It is not um, a process that's for the faint of heart. It is definitely difficult, but it's doable. Um, we have one here in Denver uh, that is operating in the city that is very difficult to assemble parcels and urban land conservancy put have put money aside to to assemble the parcels put them in a land trust so they can be saved for future development and that's that's about as much as I can share on that my expertise gotcha um, Stephanie I know you've got to cut out of here you got a hard stop in a couple of minutes are there, or were there any other questions that you saw come through that you'd like to answer before you leave or or should I just keep going just keep going. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to hop off and I really appreciate the questions and the interest. Thank you very and much. Thank you, Stephanie. And I know Chris is going to hang out here with us for at least a few more minutes. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, question here. Um, do you only accept capital gains into the fund? There's a good uh, OZ 101 question, I suppose. Yeah, good. No, great question. And happy to, and I know Stephanie had to go, Stephanie had to go raise us some, raise us some more money. So, um, Happy to answer more questions as well. So, so we will take gains that are non-capital gains, but I wouldn't advise someone to to invest into a qualified opportunity zone fund other than capital gains. You know, these are good solid investments. So, if you're just looking for a place to place money, there's nothing that will stop you from placing money with us, and we would certainly accept it as long as you're doing it eyes eyes wide open. But we have a ten year hold period. You get these massive tax benefits, but you have to keep the money with us for ten years to. Uh, to realize all those benefits. So everything that we intend to buy, or everything that we are buying, we intend to keep for 10 years. You don't need to sign up for a 10 year hold period if you're not getting the capital gains. One of the things, this is actually something I would change back to, uh, I think uh, the other question mm -hmm. is if you invest capital, if you invest capital gains, you get the deferral, the reduction and the future elimination. If you're investing non-capital gains, you don't get any of those benefits. You don't even get the future elimination. It would be great if people could just invest non-capital gains into the fund. Sure, they're not getting any interim tax benefits, but they could at least eliminate capital gains on the back end. There's been talk of that, but it hasn't passed. That's, that would be fantastic. And in that case, we would actually encourage the investment. But for right now, um, we, we generally expect people are only investing capital gains. One of, one of the great things about the benefits, and it's something that's not talked about, it's talked about sometimes, um, I know I've heard people on your podcast talk about it, Jimmy, is is this idea if you have a capital event, especially a real estate event, you're able to separate out your basis from your capital gains. So if you've got a million dollar property and you sell it for 1.2, you can get this full tax benefit by only investing the $200,000 instead of having to roll it forward like into a, you know, a 1031 like kind exchange. The ability to separate those gains from the original, the original basis is actually a huge benefit and it's why we wanna take those capital gains in but unfortunately, it doesn't make sense for most people to put non-gains into the fund. Right. Yeah, no. And just to add to that, I mean, you're absolutely right, Chris. There's nothing, there's nothing that prohibits you from putting non-capital gains into an opportunity zone fund, but you just, you don't get any of the, the tax benefits. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense in most cases. Um, another question here from Susan, can a current landowner in an opportunity zone contribute their property 
into the fund. And I think the, the final regs kind of came down hard on, on the answer to this question, but I'll, I'll let you take it, Chris. What, what's been your experience there? Yeah, that's the unfortunate, I, I, you know, they keep bringing up things I wish I could change. So the, the original, <laughs> the original guidance um, actually made it pretty clear, that it made it seem pretty clear that you could. Um, so if you're looking at stuff, be, be careful when you're looking at opportunity zone questions on the internet to look at the date of when they were answered. Mm -hmm. Because in the original, most, almost everything that came out of the final guidance was actually really positive. In December, they came out with all these guidance that was like, great, you answer this question, positive, positive, positive. The one real negative that came out is that there's not, there's differing opinions of this depending on how conservative you are. Um, but if you're doing something now, it's very difficult for a landowner to contribute property into a fund. Now you could sell it to a fund and reinvest into another fund and there's some sort of workarounds with it. We don't like playing with workarounds though. We wanna be right down the middle of the fairway. So for us, um, we're, we're generally a, a avoiding that if they're gonna maintain a long-term interest. The, the original answer was, yeah, it's easy, stay under 20%. The, the new guidance, unless it gets clarified, is just it just made it trickier it, with some details that we probably shouldn't go into on a webinar. Right, yeah, we could we could spend all day talking about some day of this and, stuff, right? Confuse ourselves, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's why I have my podcast. It's about 100 hours of, of discussion on all these sorts of things. So <laughs> if you got right. extra time, please feel free to listen. Um, but yeah, that that that's a shame that didn't work out. That that didn't shake out a little bit better. Um, I think we'll 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 just answer one or two more questions here, and then and then we'll cut you loose, Chris. Uh, Doug wants to know any plans for projects in the Durango area. Ah, uh, man, we hope so. It's you know one of the one of the fun things about this is being able to invest into into different areas. We've looked we've looked heavily at Durango, um, you know, Durango down into Pagosa, up up into Montrose. We, we definitely expect to be in those areas long term. Nothing that's committed for fund two or fund three. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of the, the, the right developer, the right project. You know, we're working with the local contractors, the right project. It's one of the areas that we, we certainly want to be. Um, you know, we're, we're actually actively looking at some projects in Gunnison, in Montrose. We're looking all over the state. We've, we've got a couple that have come our way in Durango. It's a matter of making getting projects to fit is a hard thing but we'll hopefully we'll get there we'd love to you know doug doug we'd love to talk to you more reach reach out and we can talk through that talk to i know call sean he'll he'll walk you through durango right so. on good stuff uh well i think we'll we'll uh stop it there unless i don't know chris if you see any any other questions that you want to address right now otherwise i'll i'll try to get chris to answer some of these questions uh follow up with with all of you individually if you did not get your question answered today uh, Chris, anything else you need to to share at the moment here? No, you know, I, I think I think I think just that. I mean, encourage you to reach out. You know, obviously, if you're an investor, we would love to talk to you about that. But we, we're happy to answer questions about opportunity zones. Um, you know, in, in, there's some more questions about community impact that I think we could we could get into. But be better if you have those questions to to reach out individually. Um, there were some questions about. Hey, could we? How do we get involved in like in the in the business side? You know, the business investing and the West Slope Angel side. Same answer there. Re reach out to us directly, Sean, who's who's listening in, run, runs that for us. We're, we you know we we want to be involved in supporting these communities, particularly in Colorado. For right now, we're Colorado only. We think Fund Three, Fund Four, we might be Colorado and surrounding states. Um, I can get to Wyoming and Utah faster than I can get to Denver, so we may expand a little bit. But the main encouragement I would say is to to please reach out. You know, again, my um, Jimmy's going to send this out. My direct email is on there. Happy to get you Stephanie's direct email as well. Um, we're, we're a small fund, but with that, we aim to be, you know, extremely responsive. Marco, who is on the call, listening in and helping with the questions, is in charge of investor relations and is in incredibly responsive. So, you know, please reach out anytime. And I really appreciate everybody spending so much time with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all of uh, the attendees and especially thank you to the presenters today, Stephanie Copeland and Chris Montgomery. Really appreciate your insights into opportunities on investing. Uh, excellent presentation. And again, yeah, we will follow up with you via email tomorrow. So uh, check your inbox for some more from us. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jimmy.